Sing it, brother. <laughs> saw the Lord seated on the throne he was clothed in glory and exalted high And the train of his robe yeah. it filled the temple, and the angels gathered round him and cried.
We've come this far by light of day through deserts of loneliness to this sacred place. And all my heart and all I've been through, the sin in my heart has kept me from you. And Father, you grace. Is greater than sin. Your mercy rains down and heals me again.
When I'm on my face In my darkest night I cry for a way To your shining light And Father, your grace is greater than sin Your mercy rains down It heals me again It falls down on me and heals me again. All I can do is fall down on my knees. All I can do is fall down on my knees and cry holy.
Sister Brayton, the Lord will lift you up. Amen. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask at this time, Pastor Ron's going to come, and uh, he's going to preach for us this morning. I'm excited. He's my preacher. He's uh, my right-hand man, and I'd lovely, I dearly love him. And I have him come this morning. He's been pushing down through the week to prepare for this. We were supposed to be in nationals, and uh, we weren't able to make that. We we're going to try to go Monday if the doctor will allow us, but he wouldn't allow me. To, he wouldn't allow me. He said, "You got to stay close." So uh, pray for him this morning. Amen. I'm excited for what God's given. Why are singing about holiness? Try to clean up before I come. Try to take a shower. Clean up the best I can. When they start thinking about the holiness of God, I'm kind of embarrassed about my appearance, knowing that I'm standing in His presence. And when we get a good look at God, we get a better look at ourselves. And I believe that's needful today. I believe it's something we ought to do. That we might be able to look within us and then look into the face of the Holy One and say, God, fix me. Check me out. Fix me. Make me in a better image of yourself. Most of us could stand that. I mean a little fixing up. I believe that's what church is all about. I believe that's why the choir sings and the preacher preaches. And good people meet together so that we might get a better glimpse of God, so that we might do more work on what we are. We might stand in his presence. I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Thank you for standing to honor the one that wrote what we hold, hold dear, and listen to and allow to change us. Going to church is wonderful. It's great. But if you just came to go home, then it's not going to profit you. But if you've come that you might allow God to do a little work on your life, you can go home a better person in closer fellowship with him. And that's our desire this morning. Matthew, or, or Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. Let me say Matthew 7 talks about two gates, two roads, and two destinations. Most in this world go through the wrong gate. They get on the wrong road. And they end up in the wrong destination. That's the way it works. Most do. I'm persuaded that there are some here today who have never had any spiritual victory in your life. You've never known what it was to look at Satan and disagree with him. And as a result, you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Most of you or some of you have never won a spiritual battle. You've always been overwhelmed by the size of the giant in front of you. You've always been meat for Satan's teeth. 
and you've always been burned by Satan's matches and consumed by his fire, always feeling the guilt. I want to talk to you this morning about some victory that you can have over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And it doesn't come through this church. It doesn't come through your pastor. It comes from the one that went to Calvary for you. Read with me if you will. Verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, he said, and nothing, and nothing, shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. You have given it to us. God, use us in these few moments. God, help us that we might respond to your voice and that we might pass it on to those here today. Bind us up. God, give victory over all that the devil wants to do in our life and make us more than conquerors through you. In Christ's name, amen. Victory is something I've always wanted. I've always demanded victory from my life. If I'm playing checkers with you, I want to win. If we're in a bicycle race, I want to win. And if I'm driving a Ford and you're driving a Chevrolet, I'm going to win. <laughs> There's just something about winning. There, there's something about reaching out and obtaining that prize at the end of it all. It's not him that starts out that finishes well. It's him that endures to the end, that reaches the final flag, that has his or her names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life that wins the race. It's not him who obtains the most prizes or eats the best foods or dresses the nicest. But it's him who God has reached out upon their cry and brought them safely to his side and walks with them and talks with them and is with them during the final moments of their existence, and he can say to them, well done, you did good. How long has it been since God kind of whispered down unto your ear while you were sitting in the quiet places of your life, and he said, good job, you've done good. I'm proud of you. How long has it been? since the God of all glory in our Christian existence that the presence of God comes down and he says, I'm proud of you for what you've done today. How many of you ever thought about it? Have you ever needed it? Have you ever wondered if God's going to do it? And what it might take? to allow him to come down and give us the confidence we need for the journey. Every now and then in my life he has done that. 
And I don't get over those moments. Sometimes it's when you're in the most difficult situation. Sometimes when the devil seems as close to you as you possibly can be. Sometimes it's when the waters are raging and the storm is overwhelming and the power of evil goes about us that God then comes down to minister unto us to be near unto us, that he might uh, uh, scoot up into our presence, come into our space, and hold us while the storm passes. In overwhelming fashion, he's there. And it's like mommy holding us again. It's like daddy securing us again. It's like our closest friend coming around us and yet something greater when God speaks and says, you're doing what I want you to do. You're living like I want you to live. I hope you understand that. I hope you desire that very walk. I remember cutting brush as a kid, and there was a vine called Multifloral Rose. Know what it is? It's a vine that starts out small at the base of a tree or a bush, and little by little it grows, and it matures, and it spreads out, and it advances. Sometimes, and most of the time, you can't watch it grow. You can't see its growth. You can't see it spreading, but it is. And it's advancing on strong, viral, good trees and bushes and vegetation. It climbs and it reaches out and it gets higher and higher and before long it's smothering that tree. And it's sucking the life because it's preventing the sunshine coming down in it and it's robbing it of all of the nutrients and all of the good things that that tree needs and it's shielding from life itself. Sin left alone in our life can cause our death. Did you know that? Sin begins kind of easy and insignificant, a little root at the bottom, a little spring of flesh a little bit of one's own self. And it begins to grow up our at one time strong individual that we were, and it begins to grow almost in silence it grows. And it gets higher and higher upon us. Sin left alone can cause death. James chapter 1 and verse number 13, he said, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You know what that's saying? That's saying that it ain't God's fault when we sin. It ain't his fault. It ain't your mother's fault. It ain't your father's fault. It's not your heritage that's making you do that. It's you, and it's me, because that's what the scripture is telling. He said, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. So here's the problem. Sometimes we say, oh, she is, or he is, or they are or the circumstances around me, but we're the problem. And that's what he's saying there in James in that that scripture. And he says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and then when lust is conceived, when the thing begins to grow, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, 
and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And before long, we're going down the wide and dusty road of this world and we don't have the hope we used to have. We don't have the joy we used to have. We don't have the spiritual spring in our step that we should have and we don't be able to uh, tell others about the goodness of God in the land of the living and we are a little embarrassed when they call on us to pray or when they want us to do something of the Lord's business. The psalmist said, how shall we sing of the Lord's song in a strange land? How are we going to do that? We hung our harps on the willows and we, we wept when we remembered. There's only one way to kill sin and it's a substance that comes from God. It's a substance that God in the growing or the preserving or the sharing of his son. And it's called the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. When you think about sinning, you ought to think about the cross. When you think about going down the low roads of least resistance, you ought to look to Calvary and see the man on the middle cross and understand that it takes his blood to cleanse us from that. You might call out to him and say, God, how would you then have me live? Sin's power is only severed. Christ. The beginning of this chapter, Jesus sent out 70 of his, of his disciples. And right now, where I read to you, they're coming back rejoicing. And they said, Lord, we met the devil, and the devil didn't have anything for us. Met the spirits from the damned nation, and we overcame them. How long has it been this morning since you were able to return to the one that started us out and say we're rejoicing because we didn't bow down to the devil's wishes. I want you to think about it. I want it to be there. It's so vital. They're returning with glad hearts because they've experiencing the wonderful feeling of victory. Jesus told them not to rejoice because the devils were subject unto them, but to rejoice and to be happy because their names were written in heaven. Let me see your hand this morning. If you realize and understand that your name has been recorded in a place called heaven, hey, you ought to raise it up there a little bit and shout praises to the Lord of lords for what he's done in your life. You took the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, to give us the privilege that we might be with Him one day. He said, you ought to be happy. You ought to be happy about that. Yeah. Or make you smile every now and then. You ought to be able, hey, Dana, I got saved. Amen, brother. Amen. got saved. I'm happy about that. You ought to go up to somebody every now and then Someplace, I get to where I talk to a lot of people in Walmart. They're easy to talk to in Walmart. Everybody wants to talk, especially when they're waiting impatiently on the person up there at the register where she's got about three cards. And she don't know which one to put in the little thing. And she don't know whether it's a smart card or not. She don't understand. And you just kind of have to wait there. You got time to tag on somebody and say, hey, honey, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. He loves me. I go to church at McCorkle, and we got a good choir, and we got a good pastor, and you ought to come sometime and listen to the good news of the gospel. Honey, are you saved? Every now and then, just somebody out of the blue, you ought to say, God loves me. God cares about it. Don't wait till Wednesday morning. No, we come Wednesday night, don't we? Don't wait every time. Every now and then on a Wednesday night, 
wouldn't hurt you to get up and say, Pastor, before you teach on Romans again, let me just tell everybody that I love you. You don't have to go into all the doctor reports and all of that. Just say, hey, I'm glad I'm saved. God's been good to me. My name's been recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I got something to shout about this morning because my sins are something in the history book. And my name's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's called Victory. Jesus told them that a Christian life is a life where victory is an everyday thing. A Christian life is something where it's, every, it's not out of the ordinary, it's not uncommon, it's the ordinary thing for a Christian to have victory in their life as they go down through this journey. It's not supposed to be a happy occasion once or twice a year. It's not something that just takes place on the occasion. It's not a spasmodic thing. It's something that goes down through life when God gives us the plan of salvation. We accept it into our life. We begin a journey that is filled with success and honor and we go into a journey uh, that is everything is well with our soul. Everything's not well externally, but internally there is something there. There's a joy that God gives to us. And I read over there in the book of, uh, of Romans chapter 8 when he said, who shall separate us from the love of God? Who's going to do that? The love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Or, as it is written, it's in there. He said, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are killed all day long. You know what that means? You know what that means? We're killed all day long. That means they don't kill us. We kill us. The word kills us. The world doesn't have any power on God's kids. Did you know that? The world doesn't. We're the problem. Remember over there in the book of James where he said, when we have conceived that lust in our life, and it brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. We're the, pro, pro, we're the ones that bring that on. We're the ones that cause that into our life. He said, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He said, nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through Christ that loved us. He said, in every way, when you get up in the morning, you go to work, you go to school, you go about your business, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. He said, for I'm persuaded he's been made know to know deep down in his heart. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, he said, nor height nor depth, there's not anything anywhere. Not anything anywhere that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing in this world is able to penetrate what God secures and keeps safe. Nothing in this world is able to, are you preaching eternal security? No, my friend, I'm not. I'm not preaching a doctrine. I'm preaching to you the security of the believer, of the child of God that said, I'm the Lord's and the Lord is mine. My name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if it's not, you're lost. If it's not, you have no hope in this world or the world to come. Too many people in our world have gone down to defeat. Too many. What we need is to have victory. I hope, I hope everyone in this building has experienced the victory of salvation when God reached down to where you were 
when he had to reach down in the muck and the mire of this world and lift you up. If you've never experienced that, if you've never known the difference between living a world life in the world and a world caked with sin and ugliness and filth and God reaching you down there and not putting you by the preacher's side or the pastor's side and not putting you in a choir, not putting you in a con, but putting him, he brings you up to where he is. It's not a level for the normal. He told Moses, he said, there's a place by me. And there's a place by him for every individual that wants to be there. That will say deep in their heart, God, you show me your glory. You show me. and Draw me up into your presence. It's called victory. It's called what God, I can almost... I imagine it's 12 o'clock. You know when you don't get to preach but once every six months? You just lose track of time. Sorry about that. Sorry. But I remember David going out. David needed victory that day when he was going out before the giant. I'm going to make it as close and as short as I can, okay? But it must. there was something on David's mind when he sees all of his brothers and all of his people in the nation that he loved going down the tubes and wilting in the face of this giant out on the mountain. And there must have been something looming in his heart when he walked down, run his hand into the pool of water, down into the little stream of Eli. He said, I've got to have something that will get me through because I've got to have some victory. Have you ever been there? You ever been where David stood and the giant looks so big? But you've had some fresh ammo in your pouch. You've got something that you've just obtained. Not what you had 50 years ago. Not what happened last Sunday. But something fresh in your bag. And there you stand in the greatest need that you have at that opportunity. It's that I need some victory. And the people around me need to know that I've had some victory. And you don't go to him as he comes to you. He comes to you with a shield and and all of the implements of his ungodly war that he's fighting. You stand boldly in the midst of it and I come to you in the name of the Lord. The God you curse. And we show a difference between who we are and who they are. And we pick out one of those fresh stones that, that we've just got. Quit living on 50 years ago. Quit living on yesterday. And get up in the morning with something fresh. In who and what you are. Get something fresh. And if you don't have it, come to an altar. Pour your heart out to God until God gives you something a little bit different than yesterday, a little bit greater, and there, and instead of, and most people, when they see the giant, they collapse before him. That's what a whole nation was doing. That's what his loved ones was doing. But David comes, presents himself, throws the stone, and cuts off his head and brings it up for everybody to see the fallen enemy that he had faced. And it all began with something. He said, is there not a cause? Is there not a purpose? We could tell you, most people just fall at their giant. Most people just say, man, it's too much. It's too big. But a giant falls, thundering to the ground, and a little red-headed boy takes his stand for the glory of God. You see, little is much if God is in it. We need to understand that. I've often wondered how Daniel must have felt there that day when the king said, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. I don't have any power, but the God that you've told me about, is he able to keep you? And old Daniel said, O king, live forever. O king, you just get on the best way you can. But he said, I've been in the lion's den. 
and I'm still talking to you. Some of you have always been fodder for the lions that roar against you. Some of us don't have victory in our heart and in our life. And there's a cure for that. There's something that when, when, the, when, the, when the thing is rolled away and the king calls down to you and he said, hey, are you still alive? You can say yes. Well, God has sent his angel down here to where I needed him most. Most of us. Let me just tell you something. Nobody had ever walked away from the giant. Not one. He was the champion, if that's what it meant. Nobody had walked away from the den where the lions were. No one. Nobody had walked away until the angel came down and met with his buddy. I want God to love me, and I want God to sit down with me and hug me up real close sometimes. That's what I want. Amen. I want God to be there. I want, I want the presence of God to be real in my life, preacher. I don't want him to just show up from time to time. I want to walk with him. Because when I enter into the den, I want to be able to say, hey, God, hey, if you got any angels up there, it's time. And the guy said, Daniel said, an angel came and shut the lion's mouth. Let me just tell you about Shadrach. Because some, most people just get burnt by the devil's magic. Most of the time, we're consumed by the fires that get too close to us. He burns up our homes. He burns up our children. He burns up our happiness. He destroys everything in the consumption of his own fear. He allows it to be gone because we give him that power and we allow him to do it. Because no one had ever come out of the, out of the lion's den. Nobody for sure. When Nebuchadnezzar, he heated the furnace as hot as it could have been heated. And he was mad. Let me just ask you a question. When was the last time you made the devil mad? Oh, think about it. I know it's a hard question. Think about it. When's the last time you made the devil mad? I'm not talking about making God happy. I'm talking about making the devil mad. It's time the devil didn't get his way in a lot of areas of our life. And the old king was angry. His visage was changed. Everything about him. He said, I want these boys to be crispy. Extra, extra done. He said, heat the furnace, heat the furnace, heat the furnace, heat the furnace. The devil is all the time heating the furnace for a uh, uh, might for you, for him. He's heating the furnace. He's making preparation for our destruction. He's working on us. He's causing us to have all of that. And he wants to burn up your existence. I better close my Bible. It's getting late. Sometimes God puts out the fire. And sometimes, Roger, God just gets in there with you. And that's what he did there. He looked in there. The king looked in there. And he said, who in the world is that? 
it looks like the Son of God. How long has it been since the world peered in on your life and said, hey, there's somebody with him. He ought to be falling. He ought to be laying. He ought to be dead by now. Because Satan lit his fire. Satan struck his match. And most of the time it consumes. But God saw fit on that occasion to come down and stand and celebrate with his kids who he was. I don't know how much victory you got in your life. I don't know. But I know how much God wants you to have it. I know that. God wants you to be more than conquerors through Him that loves us. He strengthens you when you come to church. And the devil weakens you when you don't. It's that simple. He strengthens you when you read the Word of God. And He weakens you when you don't. It strengthens you when you get on your face before God and say, God, I need your company. And it diminishes your life when you don't call out to Him. This is my message. I'm going to quit. I could preach. Like I said, I don't get many opportunities. But I want you to have victory. You say, preacher, what's it all about? I didn't have one, two, and three, A, B, or C. But I want you to understand this morning that God wants you to have victory. It's not just this preacher. It's not just me. God wants you to have victory at what you're facing right now. The fire, the match is already lit. Whether it burns you up, that's up to you. Whether or not the lion takes a bite and, and Satan's teeth are red with your consumption, that's up to you. Whether or not you are able to stand before the giant is up to you. And if you're fighting with a foe, if you're fighting with a battle that you can't do anything with, it's time that God joined your ranks or you joined his and allowed him to give you victory. Would you stand this morning as we give you an invitation to pray? Pray that God would have his way. Make a difference in your life. If you're not where God wants you to be, if you don't have any victory in your life, if you're all the time walking down the road of least direction, if you're not where God wants you to be, pray that you would come to the altar, call out to God, and say, God, I need some help. <coughs> I need your strength. I need your mind to be in my life. The choir sings. You need to pray this morning. We got time. We got time for you to pray. Shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. 
Who I used to be. 